My guest today on this edition of In the Credits is writer-producer Jill Goldsmith, among whose works are NYPD Blue, The Practice, Allie McBeal, and a personal favorite of mine, Law and Order. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. I know you were a public defender in Chicago before you came out west to begin work on, I believe, NYPD Blue. Was that your first assignment? That's right. That was my first opportunity, yeah. How you got here is fascinating, and I think anyone watching this, particularly aspiring writers, are going to be fascinated by that route. Can you explain how you got to NYPD Blue from a public defender's office? Yes, that's a million dollar question. Everyone wants to know is how, you know, what was your path into this? And it's not a linear story, you know, and it's interesting to me because in the law everything is about reasonableness, the reasonable man standard and reasonable doubt. And in the law, you know, and in a lot of other professions, there's a linear path that you can follow. You know, if you go to college and then you take the LSATs and you, you know, go to law school and take the bar, there are steps you can take. And the thing about Hollywood and about the entertainment industry is there is no linear path through it. It's like SeaWorld. Anything can happen. But the good thing is anything can happen. And the process for me, um, well, I should start out with saying that one of the things I recently found, one of my best friends from childhood was cleaning out her parents, uh, her room at her parents' house, and she found these postcards that she and I had been writing back and forth when I was away at summer camp, when I was probably about 11. And I didn't remember this at all, but we must have been talking about what we would be when we grew up. And I only had conscious recollection of wanting to be a ballerina or a princess, you know, or something that I thought would be sweet. But right there on the postcard in my 11-year-old fat cursive writing, I had written, when I grow up, I will be, not even I want to be, I will be a lawyer and a writer. And it sort of stunned me, you know, because I thought there was something inside of me that knew what I had come to do. I mean, my first reaction was, you know, frustration at her that she had not cleaned out her closet sooner <laughs> and given me that kind of enlightenment. It took me many years to find my way to that path. But I do believe that inside of us are the seeds of us knowing what we came to do, you know, mm -hmm. where our gifts lie, where our passion lies, where our heart's desire lies. So the way it unfolded for me, I had always written growing up. I just didn't know about script form. And I assumed that, you know, after the practice of law, when I was older, you know, I would go to the woods and rent a cabin and, you know, write prose or fiction. I just didn't have a form to be able to translate my experiences into. And I also had this passion for public defending. I went to law school specifically because that's what I wanted to do. And it was interesting that the first image I ever saw of a public defender was on television on Hill Street Blues, Joyce Davenport, and that many years later, my first job would be for the man who had created that image, Stephen Bochco, on NYPD Blue. Mm -hmm. But I was a public defender in Chicago, and I was, you know, I think that experience really ha helped to quicken my awareness because every day I was having to make decisions that impacted people's lives and make decisions that you had no, no ability to really know what the outcome would be. You're making judgment calls. If I do this, then this will happen. Or I'll take the shot going this way. You just don't know what the outcome will be. So I really began to rely on my intuition. And I began to realize how when little things would filter into my consciousness, if I followed up on them, there was always something connected to it. If something popped into my head and you know, I followed it up, there was an outcome on the other side. So I began to become more and more aware of what was going on. And in that time, occasionally scripts would get submitted to our office for us to look at for legal accuracy. Now, at the time, you know, if you're trying a death penalty case, the last thing you want to do is take a look at some script from some writer out in Hollywood and say, you know, is this trunk search correct? You know, and there was one that got submitted um, and somebody had a public defender show and they wanted somebody to look at it. And somehow it got deposited on my, off, you know, on my desk in my office. My boss said, you know, you're literate, you do it. It's your turn, you know. And I didn't particularly relish that. But I still remember the minute I opened it and started reading it, it was like a language that I recognized, that I spoke, that I didn't even know existed. You know, I understood the form of it, the structure of it, how the story was pulled through the different acts, how the characters were voiced. And it was like this quickening of my awareness. And it, it turned out, m many years later, I found out that that writer was John Wells, who went on oh, to create yes. ER. And I believe he was right off of China Beach. This is going way back in the recesses mm -hmm. of my memory. But he's now on West Wing, isn't he? Yeah, yes. he's, he's a, a major producer in yes. television. But it was interesting that way back then, the very first writer whose script I read was Amazing. won by him. And so it, I began to wonder, well, what is this thing called a screenplay or a teleplay? And I began to read books on it. I began to read actual screenplays. And until I really felt 
that I understood what this form was and I knew, you know, well, here's this form that I have all these stories that without realizing it, I've been amassing, you know, all this experience and all these stories, things that upset me, frustrated me, injustices that I saw, things that moved me, you know, and here was this very usable form, but it still seemed so big and grandiose because I knew no one, you know, and mm -hmm. everyone you know, and their mother, you know, would love to write a script. You know, I, I just had no channel for it. And a lot of synchronistic things began happening around that for me that I became aware of. I felt like I was, as my interest in that grew and deepened, I was being directed to it also. And an example of that, uh, one example is one day, it was a Friday afternoon, and when, you, when someone else is trying a case in the courtroom that you're assigned to, you kind of have to sit in back of court and wait for that to be done until it's your turn for your case. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting back there with the prosecutor, and even though you're on the opposite side, you're still cronies, you know. And we were talking, and he turned to me and said, why don't you just put us all out of our misery and just write a script already? <laughs> so I must have been, you know, judging from that remark, I must have been going on and on saying, oh, I would love to write, you know. And I said, because I don't, it, it just seems too grandiose. It, it seems like it would be trying to bail out the ocean with a teaspoon. I don't know anyone. There's no linear channel. Is this just you know, an ego fantasy of mine. I wish I had some tangible sign that this was the right path for mm -hmm. me. And that very day as I was leaving court, and it was a sunny Friday, and I had the rest of the afternoon off, and, you know, I'm driving home, this one client kept popping into my head. And it was an ugly case. It was a murder, and it wasn't up for months, and there was no good reason why I needed to go talk to him that day. But I couldn't get him out of my mind, and I thought, you know what, there must be something he needs to tell me. Some development on his case, something about a witness, just some reason... I need to go talk to him. And I thought, you know, I got to go. So I'm driving to this high security division of the jail, which is awful. It's underground with barbed wire, and it's the sunny day. And I'm thinking, you know, why couldn't I have aspired to be a florist, you know, or something <laughs> pretty and nice and peaceful, and here I'm doing this, you know. But I pulled into the parking lot, and right away I saw they were filming a movie in the parking lot. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I've never seen production. I'm very interested in this medium. You know, I wonder if I can ask if I can just hang out in the background and watch them film a shot. So as I'm walking to the door of the jail, my, you know, I'm like the Terminator. My eyes are like scanning the horizon, like, who can I ask? And I thought I just needed to find a couple of low-level techie guys and just say, can I hang out here in the background and watch you film? So I see a couple of guys sitting down, T-shirts, ball caps. They're doing nothing. Everyone else is running around very efficiently and setting up equipment. And I think, well, these guys must not be very important because they're not doing anything. You know, of course, those are always the people in charge. <laughs> but, you know, thank God I didn't know that because I might not have had the guts to do what I did, which is walk right up to them and just say, hey, would you guys mind if I watched you film a shot? You know, and they were like, oh, are you a lawyer? And I said, yeah, public defender. And we talked for about 10 minutes, and they introduced themselves and, themselves, and the movie was Primal Fear, and it was the producer and the director. And they brought Richard Gere over and introduced me to Richard Gere, and they were showing me how they were getting shots, and mm -hmm. they were talking about the film. And, you know, I thought, well, isn't that interesting? I mean, those weren't people who I called or contacted, you know, but... That was the sign I had just asked for, if mm -hmm. only that there was some sense that this path, you know, was the path for me to go down. And that's just kind of a huge example of, of you know, course. and there were much smaller synchronicities that happened too, and I just began to get a stronger and stronger sense, you know, this is real, and I want to give it a shot. So what I did was I resigned my job, you know, and everyone thought I was nuts, you know, because everything is so reasonable, you know, and they're like, now you know who, and you're going out there for what job? And they just couldn't wrap their minds around the fact that I was giving up something that I had been, you know, working for for quite a while and sure. had attained a certain level of mastery and achievement over and was giving it up, you know, for nothing. And I had enough of a pension to float me for a year, and I thought, you know what, I'll give it a year, and in a year, if nothing happens, I can regroup. I can take the California bar. I can come back to Chicago. I mean, there are a million things I can do. But, you see, I had never thought that way before. I felt so locked in, you know, sure. to every step of achievement. And I deconstructed my life there. I gave away most of everything that I own because I thought I'm not going to move it out there and put it in storage. I gave away a lot of my clothes to this one drag queen client of mine who seemed to appreciate my taste and, you know, and, and left and moved out here with what I call the three C's, my car, my cat, and my computer. And I had a very good friend, a girl I'd grown up with who was an architect who lived in Santa Monica and she had the all-important couch that I could sleep on while I got situated. I think all you need when you move somewhere new is the one person who knows you, sure. you know, as your ground zero and promptly went into complete depression because I had deconstructed this whole life, and here I was, you know, and who was I if I was not what I did? Mm -hmm. We define ourselves so much by what we do in the outer world. And I was used to putting on a suit and going to the courthouse and being recognized in a certain way and having, you know, 
high level of you know responsibility. I mean, what other profession do you sit between a man and death? I mean, it's, it's crazy, you know, and make decisions that impact people's lives. And here I was waking up in the morning on someone's couch and going to Starbucks, you know, and trying to break in as one does. And what does one do? That's the question. You know, you, you try to go to writing classes, go to writing groups, try to take meetings, you know, but it was very difficult. It felt very blocked and months went by and I realized that's a sh very short period of time compared to a lot of people's struggles, but every day felt like a lifetime, mm -hmm. you know, for me. And I was watching the money slip away, and I had no discernible path in, you know, but I felt very strongly this is what I was supposed to do. And one night, it was a Saturday night, um, the height of depression, <laughs> thinking, you know, on Monday, I have to rethink it. I have to just do something different because I deconstructed my life foolishly and had this wicked chocolate craving. I just wanted good chocolate. I was so depressed. I was the depressed girl. And I knew of one really good chocolate shop down in the Third Street Promenade near where I lived. And I went down there and there was even a long line to buy chocolate. Like not even that was easy, you know, on a Saturday night. And I arrived in the line about the same time as another man who had gotten there and that sort of jockeying for position like, oh no, you go ahead, you go ahead. And struck up a conversation with him. And under ordinary circumstances, I just never would have revealed anything personal about myself to a stranger because, you know, I represented people who did very bad things. I'm just very private with my information, but for some reason it was just one of those nights where I just felt open and like I could talk to, talk to a stranger, you know, and I said, oh, you know, I'm depressed and that's why I was there buying the chocolate and why are you depressed? And I explained to him I'd been a public defender in Chicago and I'd come out here to write. And he asked me what I'd written and I said nothing because I don't <laughs> know how to even, you know, get my foot in the door. and. He gave me a card and told me that his name was David Milch and he had created a show called NYPD Blue and that he would read a script. And, you know, that was the amazing beginning, you know. And at that point I went and, and to the television museum in Beverly Hills. I think it's very funny that there is a museum <laughs> devoted to television, but there is. And watched as many episodes of NYPD Blue as I felt I needed to really get a handle on what that mm -hmm. show was and wrote an episode of that. And when I finally got a meeting with David and got that script to him, they wound up buying it and shooting it, and that launched my career in television. Mm. But, you know, when you look at, oh, I guess the addendum to that story is I went back to the chocolate shop to buy him chocolate to thank him, and it was no longer there. It had really? become some other business. So I thought, you know, maybe it was like Brigadoon. It existed only that night right. to effectuate our meeting. You know, so I guess if you were to look at that story, you would say give up everything you have, <laughs> move halfway across the country, you know, go buy chocolate, and these things happen. But to me, what that illustrates is, like what Goethe said, when you take a step forward, all manner of things in the universe are set in motion that can come to your aid that mm -hmm. never would have been set in motion had you not taken that step. So the underlying principle is what I feel is really the gift from that experience, because it showed me that when you really align yourself with an intention, with what you want to do in your heart, you can't begin to see the way the path would unfold. Mm -hmm. I never could have choreographed that myself. I mean, that was cosmic choreography, yes. you know, but I had to do everything to get myself to that place. And there's an old story that I love about a, a German chemist. Um, it was around the time when the scientific community was trying to understand the chemical structure of benzene, and no one could crack it. And this one scientist, whose name escapes me at the moment, had a dream. And in the dream, he saw a snake swallowing its own tail. And he woke up and he understood the benzene ring, which is this ring which constantly consumes itself. And the rest of the scientific community said, oh, that's too easy. You know, they didn't want to give him the credit for that because they said, you did nothing. You know, you just had a dream. And he said, visions come to prepared spirits. So it's the idea that you do everything you can, you know, to pursue mm -hmm what it is you want to do and you have to trust that the rest of it will come to you you know it, but it doesn't come to you until you move toward it you know and so if I had waited I really felt like if I had waited in Chicago for that op tangible opportunity that never would have come it was only through the process of stepping out of all the things I had padded around myself mm -hmm. you know that I was in a place that was open enough to be able to strike up a conversation with the very man <laughs> who was probably the only man in the entire industry who would have been a generous enough spirit you know, to offer a stranger that opportunity. It's wonderful. The, the desire was the driving force, the, the, uh, the internal desire you had to become what you have become. Just made that happen. When you were working on NYPD Blue, I'm, I'm assuming you did more than one episode or did not? The, I just did that one, one episode, episode and then from there I was hired by David Kelly. David Kelly the on the practice. Episodic television, that is continuing characters, were you handed a Bible of character descriptions or, or just a, a series of scripts to acquaint yourself with the, the practice? 
cast or characters? What I did is just read a lot of scripts and watch the existing episodes. Uh -huh. I didn't, I don't remember ever reading a Bible on that per se, mm -hmm. but you can pick it up, you know, from sure. watching the episodes and reading the scripts. Yeah. Again, uh, something that was very comfortable for you because that was even more related to your previous employment as a lawyer. I really felt like that was the perfect container yeah. to be able to share a lot of the stories and moments, you know, and experiences that I had had as a public defender because it was a direct, it was a direct relation, you mm -hmm. know, of those stories. Um, you know, whereas NYPD Blue, I had to shift it to be from the cop's perspective and have it play out in the interrogations. I could really play it out in the courtroom, which was, you know, like second nature to me. So. When you were working on the practice or any of the shows you've worked on, have you thought first about how the characters are going to work within the framework of the story, or do you first and foremost think of a plot thread that's going to run through that particular episode and then attach the characters to that plot thread, or are they pretty much uh, a simultaneous it's creation? A it's different ideas come in different ways at different mm -hmm. times, but the way I seem to mostly do it is I have the idea, like the bigger I idea around the story first, you know, like a subject matter area or there's something, you know, an issue or an idea that I really am interested in myself and so want to play it out. And then from there, it, if, it's, if that's the right idea, everything sort of snaps into place simultaneously. You sort of see which of the characters in the episode would be, would be best suited, you know, might mm -hmm. have the most dramatic resonance with that storyline, you know, and, and from there you sort of plot out the structure to create the outcome that you want. And what I really like to do is have stories where you have different things going on. It's what I love about writing closing arguments. You know, you get to write it from two different perspectives and it's not like I'm stacking the deck one way or the other. I'm really exploring, you know, each of the truths of that because so often there's truth in both positions, you know. Mm. So when, when I'm writing from one perspective, I completely believe that. And then when I'm writing the other perspective, I completely believe that you know, and leave it to the viewers to wrap their minds around those things too. Not telling people what the answers would be, but really raising the questions to have people think about it just as it was of interest to me to consider that. And that is truth because in a normal situation, a courtroom, whether it's a prosecutor or a defense attorney, each of them has to devote 100% of their energy to that particular job. So it has to be balanced, otherwise it becomes unrealistic. Yeah. That's right. You have to do your part in the process so that the outcome can result, you know, and you have to trust, trust in that outcome. And sometimes you feel it's good and sometimes it's, you know, awful, but, you know, all you can do is your part in it. You know? So many television programs years ago involving lawyers tended to be very black and white. The, the lawyers were always the good guys and the criminals were always the worst possible human beings. And if you're a Perry Mason, you're defending someone, and at the end you have something happen that surprises everyone else, and then the case is over. But it's unrealistic. It, it just doesn't have any yeah. resonance. Yeah, well, I never had anyone confess from the gallery. You know, <laughs> that would have been nice, but you know, it doesn't happen that often. And it's often not what you see on television, which is a big twist, and the truth is revealed, and everybody goes away happy. It's chipping away, you know, at the other sides, you know, the moments are, are smaller than what you see on mm -hmm. television, you know. It's trying to add up the weight of many, you know, pieces of, you know, that you've chipped away at the other side's case. It's, it's much more an in-the-trenches battle. It's, it's often not so clear-cut as you go, aha, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's the truth, you know. The, the dramatic moments are smaller, but, you know, just as impactful in their, own, in their own way. One of the things that I've always found most impressive about Bochco, Milch, David Kelly and Dick Wolf is that their programs don't necessarily fit into the traditional legal mold. They don't always have happy endings. The episodes are not always resolved within that time period, within one hour. It might take three hours. Now Law and Order tends to be more compact, but the other shows, Kelly's programs and Bochco's tend not to necessarily follow a strict guideline. When you were working on the practice and Allie McBeal and, and NYPD, on that one script for NYPD, did you feel a little uncomfortable that perhaps you didn't have enough control over that one hour time slot or were you given enough comfort by the producers to, uh, to work within that framework where everything wasn't resolved within one hour particularly? Or? Well, 
I feel like, you know, once I had pitched my story ideas, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I did that one script for NYPD Blue, and, and I was a writer on the practice who occasionally would do an Allie McBeal, mm -hmm. you know, for the comic relief of it. <laughs> um, you know, and then with Law and Order, you pitch your ideas, and then they tell you which idea they want you to go write, you know. And, you know, I think the best stories really do come from raising all those different questions. And even if, in the end, there's a neat resolution of it, it's satisfying that within the body of the story, you're able to put all those balls into play. Mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like as long as I felt like I could put those pieces into play and raise those questions, you know, then I felt satisfied even if there needed to be a particular resolution one way or the other. Mm -hmm. you know? As far as dialogue is concerned, do you hear the characters when you're writing? Do they speak to you as characters or do you develop the dialogue based primarily on how the plot's going to dictate the dialogue? Can you hear, for example, could you hear Lenny Briscoe on Law & Order uh, talking to you as Lenny Wood or the lieutenant? Or do they just come, does the dialogue come naturally out of the plot that you're developing? Well, the characters are so well-defined, mm -hmm. you know, and they existed long before I ever, you know, for right. whom you're talking about Law & Order, long before I ever joined that show, you know, that they are very much alive in their own right, and you do hear their voices in your head. Yet at the same time, you know, particularly with Law and Order, that's a very story-driven, you know, very right. uh, structural show. So you know you have to go into the scene. You know, you think you're going for A. A few things happen, and you wind up getting B, you know, at the end of it, which launches you into the next scene. You know, right. it's very tightly woven like a puzzle. And if you pull one thread, you know, in Act 1, it affects the entire rest of the script. So you are trying to get certain information through in the course of the scene, but yet at the same time, the art to it, I guess, is doing that in a way that, that is seamless, you know, and you hear the character speaking also. So mm -hmm. it kind of all works together. And it's nice when characters are very specifically defined. It's much easier to write characters whose voices you do hear mm -hmm. as, oppo as opposed to more neutral characters, you know, because the lines, you can tell when you look at a line for a well-defined character if that rings true or not. You could hear it in your head. You know, it's the characters who, who aren't so specifically defined, you know, that are harder to write for because you think, what, who is this person? What am I trying to do here? Is this how they sound? You mm -hmm. know, whereas if it's a very clearly, you know, constructed character, it, it just makes it that much easier. When you're going in to pitch an idea, do you have something like a treatment, a two-page treatment, or do you just simply go in and have a conversation with the producer or the story editor? How does that normally work for you, particularly? It, it depends on the circumstance, but in general, before I walk in to a room to discuss an idea with someone, I really want to have my head wrapped around the idea for myself, to know what the idea is, why I would want to write about it, what the truths are I would want to illuminate about that subject matter area, why I thought it would work well for that show or those characters. You know, sometimes it's scattershot. They just want to know a story area, and you just want to run something by them to say, would you be interested in this before you develop it further? Would you be interested in, you know, for instance, on Law and Order, I did an episode about, uh, I read an article about a professor who believed that racism was a form of mental illness that should be in the dsm four, and I thought, well, that's interesting because aren't prejudices, you know, how are they different than any other delusion that people hold, you know, and I wanted to do an episode that explored that. So I checked, you know, to ask, is this something you might be interested in? And when they said yes, then I was able to go flesh it out and how it would play out through the four acts. So some, sometimes it's that, sometimes it's a subject matter area and you're just asking, would you be interested in this area? Hmm. And sometimes you have the fully conceived universe of the story, in which case, you know, I would want to feel comfortable enough with it myself to be able to go in and really communicate to them what it was, how it would play out, what the different dimensions would be, how the characters would be interplaying within that, you know, what the overall questions, you know, would be raised. I really want to feel like that would hold for me so that if they say yes, I can go pay it off, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes you, you might have an idea and it might, you might think it's a great idea and as you start to flesh it out, you see, you know what, it really doesn't have the legs, you know, to hold the whole way, you know, so maybe I can integrate it into a different context or a different story and maybe it's just a piece of a story you know so different things come in different ways and it just depends on the circumstance you know if you're pitching a pilot then you really no need to know the complete universe of that world and every detail of that world mm -hmm. because you're painting that picture for someone else you know and if you're pitching an episode of a show it really depends on what they're looking for if they want to approve the subject matter area or if they're really looking for the complete story well, on law and order particularly although I, I assume it's true probably less so on NYPD blue for you but on Law and Order, by the f end of the first half hour, all the police investigation must or must be close to be 
completed so that the legal side can take over. When you were writing for Law and Order, was that something that was uncomfortable to, to deal with, or did you just naturally fall into that pattern and it didn't seem like an issue for you? It's a matter of just learning what the template is for that universe. Mm -hmm. And that was a different uh, structure and a different template than the practice that I had just been writing mm -hmm. for, you know, which jumped into the legal issues right from the start and was much more character oriented. So I did have to sort of funnel myself into that universe at first. You know, the first mm -hmm. script I wrote for them was the transition. And then once I, I think a lot of life is pattern matching. You learn the pattern of something. And once you learn the pattern, then you begin to learn how to work within that pattern to mm -hmm. let your truth come through it. And so once I learned the pattern of that, then I was able to you know, use it as mine, you know, but there is always that transition phase when you're beginning to write a new script right. or a new show. It just becomes unconscious after a while. We're not even aware of the, of the pattern so much as just um, getting the plot to where you want it to end up. And right? once you have that structure in your head, then I think you can learn at a very accelerated rate. Little pieces are coming to you all the mm -hmm. time and then you can't stop thinking about it. Everything that's happening is to me a law and ep that's order right. episode because that's where my mind is. You know? So it's a matter of opening those channels for yourself so that the ideas can flow into that. Mm -hmm. I mentioned before we sat down here today that um, years ago, I, I was still teaching English, I had David Gerald, uh, a well-known writer of, uh, particularly of Star Trek, uh, The Trouble with Tribbles, as a guest in one of my classes. And the question arose, how do you become a writer? Because these are students in high school and college, and that question always comes up with professional writers. How, how do you become a writer? And David's answer was very simple and very realistic. He said, well, you are a writer. That's all. If you don't have the talent, to be a writer, you cannot become a writer as you think the writer should be in your life. And I think that's probably true, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, my feelings on it are, well, my mother taught English, you know, and, you know, she would say you can teach someone how to diagram mm -hmm. a sentence, but you can't teach them what to say with that sentence. Right. That is the voice of the soul, that is the voice of the individual. And I always feel like, you know, when I'm talking to people and they say, well, I want to be a writer, my question is, well, what do you want to say? Sure. Because the desire to have something to say, what it is you feel the need to express, should drive the process of why you want to write, as opposed to, I, you know, being, I want to be a writer, I'm just going to find something to write about. Because it's not detached from who you are. It's an integral part of who you are. Mm -hmm. And you're continuously making discoveries in the course of writing that expand you. And, you know, and... What I feel like for myself is, you know, I know what it feels like because I, you know, walk that life path and, and work toward it to, you know, be of service to other people, you know, being a public defender, to feel like, you know, I know to wake up in the morning and go sit in a cell and talk with someone who's in a hard place and try to figure out, you know, how best to proceed. And if I'm not going to be in service in that way, and if I'm not going to be doing something where I feel like, you know, there's meaning behind what I'm doing, then I need to be doing something, I need to feel like there's meaning in the writing for me. Mm -hmm. Like I'm expanding, you know, my own awareness and other people's awareness around certain social issues. Or maybe bringing attention to something that they might know, not know about, something that I thought was unjust. Or sharing something that was very moving to me. Something that is in service, however you define that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the trappings behind what being a writer means. Because unless I feel that there is a point to it, a reason to it, something that I feel compelled to say, then I might as well be doing something else. Mm -hmm. you know, so I believe the best thing anyone can do for their writing is to evolve themselves and to evolve their own consciousness. Because every piece of creative work carries with it necessarily the consciousness of the creator. You cannot write beyond what it is you know as mm -hmm. a soul. So the more you can do to evolve your own awareness and the more you can do to expand your own consciousness and to learn and to grow and to experience and to reflect, that is all reflected in the work and should be reflected in the work and in fact is the only thing you have authenticity to speak to is your truth and what you have learned and what your path is. Mm -hmm. Your mother was a teacher. Did you ever discuss the possibility that you would eventually become a professional writer or was this something that never came up as a dinner table conversation or anything of that sort? Well, in fact, sometimes she used to punish us by having us write essays. So Is that right? <laughs> I think she's just happy we didn't form such a negative association <laughs> with writing that it would have soured me on it altogether. Uh, yeah, I think writing was always a part of my awareness. It was always what I excelled at. It was always what was easy for me. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know 
how to translate it into an everyday job. Back in the Midwest, in, you know, the time I was growing up, there was no awareness of Hollywood and scripts. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, out here in L.A., it's funny, I, I read some news story where somebody was going up to people randomly in parking lots, you know, and asking, how's your screenplay going? And I think something like 92% of the people had an answer. You know, there were like 80-year-old <laughs> grandmas saying, well, my second act is kind of dragging. You know, there's just an enormous awareness of it now, you know, and it's in, you know, the psyche and the consciousness, oh, let's write a screenplay or do a movie. But at the time that I was, you know, growing up and deciding what to do, that just, I just didn't know that that was even an option, you know. So my writing didn't take that form. I thought, you know, I didn't see any way to integrate it into the life that I was leading. And in fact, being a public defender and doing that required such an enormous amount of emotional energy. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you can't be in the courts, you know, slugging it out all day long and go home and, you know, have your creative energy freed up to be writing your novel at night. Sure. My energy was spent preparing for the next day's closing argument. My creativity flowed into the pieces of the trial, mm -hmm. writing the opening statement, the closing argument, the cross-examinations, knowing, like, when you're preparing a cross, you have to be prepared for all eventualities. If the witness answers this, then I go to this mm -hmm. place, you know, and which is interesting because, in effect, you're writing your own dialogue. That's right. You know, That's so a lot of that translated into script form for me, you know. That seems like a very natural transition, and, and uh, what you just said is, is a practical step from one profession to another, where you are anticipating what someone might say is exactly what a screenwriter so is So my life doing. was absorbed in observing characters and so observing were, people on the witness stand. You were stand. getting trained as a screenwriter while you were working in an entirely different profession, which is never considered quite the same, but the way you described it is, it's very close and with preparing briefs and closing arguments and so on. Of course, at the time, I didn't understand that that's what no, it was, no. but in retrospect, you know, when I'm writing a script and there's a witness on the stand, it's just, you know, I'm, it's the same thing I was experiencing every day in court because there's a whole assortment of, you know, characters walking around the courthouse, you know, and it's a great way to observe, you know, it's like being in an airport, you observe the quirks of human behavior and, right. you know, people will surprise and amaze you, you know, with their dark places and, and how amazing they can be, you know, both at the same time, you just learn a lot about the spectrum of human nature. And I never could have had that kind of, you know, access, I think, to, you know, a, a awareness of, you know, different things that are in my psyche now as a result of having done that, right. you know, if I hadn't had this quickened, you know, process of being in the criminal courts every day. It was like my education, you know. Were you taking any sorts of actual notes when you were in this situation or were you just remembering things that stood out as particularly memorable that have, have become useful as a writer? Or? Oh, I wish I would have taken notes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because you think you'll remember things forever. You think it's so indelibly mm -hmm. etched in your memory. And it's such a horrible way for the travesties you see and such a wonderful way for the joys. You know, but the truth is, once I came out here and began writing, I tried to, from memory, jot down you know, all the stories I could remember, a lot of little bits or moments or things that I could use you know, in characters. Um, you know, so I have that, and I'll remember different things at different times. Something that someone will say will jog my memory, mm -hmm. and thank God I have a lot of friends back there still doing that work who can remind me of, oh, remember when this happened, you know? So I feel like, you know, I've got it covered, but, you know, at the time, it wasn't anything so intentional as, you know, I'm going to save all these, you know, I'm going to harvest these ideas right. and take them. It was just, at the time, my awareness shifted as to this is what I'm going to do, you know, was pretty much at the time I was closing out there. I was closing down shop. So I didn't really harvest those ideas over the right. years in the moment, knowing the I was moment. going to use them. You said you saw some injustice, probably quite a bit of injustice over a period of years. Have you written scripts in which you've attempted to address those injustices and come out with a happy resolution for the injustice you saw, or is this something that is not part of your makeup as a writer? Do you think about it in those terms? Or? Well, I like to raise the issue or the question, you know, as to the dynamics behind the scenes in that universe. You know, I don't necessarily like making a happy resolution of things just to have, you know, to, so everyone can walk away and feel mm -hmm. happy. I like raising the questions, right. you know. I don't like tidy endings because that wasn't my experience as to what life is. Mm -hmm. There are so many shades of gray. You know, there are a lot of, you know, awful things going on, but there are a lot of, you know, good people that get caught up in the system, people who did one thing but didn't do everything or, you know, there's just a lot of, you know, different, you know, there's a whole spectrum of different human events and human nature that is at play. And not only for just stories that are about the legal system, but, you know, one thing I really like writing within the context of the law 
is, you know, a trial is just a tool for analysis. It's, you can take something that you, you, know, you see going on in society and really hold it up to scrutiny and look at it from different angles and say, what do I really think about this? You know, so it's not necessarily always per se about the dynamics of the profession. But, you know, for instance, I did a, an episode last year for Law and Order about Falun Gong, this movement in China, you know, that is being suppressed. Fascinating story. And I yeah. thought, you know, how, is this any different than, you know, Christians in Rome, anytime mm -hmm. there's an emerging, you know, group with a spiritual belief that threatens the system in power, you know, how is that handled? And I thought that was an interesting universe and so constructed a story, you know, about a murder in New York that tracked back to that. So, you know, stories happen in different ways. Sometimes it's about the dynamics of the profession and sometimes it's just a societal issue that you think can be handled in the context of that. Was that a, a very difficult script for you to write because it was so complex and it, it seemed to me to have must have involved quite a bit of research or not? Did you have quite a bit or did you know oh, quite I did. a bit? Anytime already? I go into a subject matter area, I want to make sure I know everything from all sides of it, mm -hmm. you know, to be fair, because I don't want to stack the deck one way or the other, right. and I might not know everything there is to know. So I like to feel like I've wrapped my mind around whatever there is to know about that area and then begin spinning off those different viewpoints into the different characters so that in the end there's this complete circle of all the ideas that are contained within that, right. you know, because right. otherwise you're not really seeking the truth, you know, you're imposing a truth on the situation that may or may not be reflective of actual truth. Yeah. Have you ever had any ideas for uh, either a criminal activity on an episode or, or a plot line that has been dismissed out of hand as being completely unrealistic or, or not producable? in that sense? Oh, I've had, you know, the reaction, oh, that would never happen. Would you never know, happen. sometimes the reality seems stranger, you know, than, mm -hmm. you know, than fiction because people will come up with all kinds of strange, you know, yeah. things to do, you know, but you try to then find a way to tailor it so that it is more palatable, that people would, you know, you ground it into something else so that it, be, it feels more believable. But no, I mean, I tell you, if you sit for you know, a week in the criminal courts, you will see things that are much more entertaining than any of the major networks, you know. One of the things I love about all the shows you've worked on, and um, a show that pre preceded your career by probably 30 years called The Defenders back in, I guess it was 60, 61 on CBS, a very unusual show for its time because it didn't always have a resolution. It was two public defend or two defenders of, of criminals with not necessarily a neat, tidy ending. Mm -hmm. Usually there was some sort of wrap-up, but it wasn't uh, a cliché ending. It was often sad, or at least resolved in a realistic way. V very rare to find that then, and still rare after all those years, now in the, in the 21st century, to find programs that are risking not having everything neatly tied up at the end. That must be very appealing to you as a writer. I like something that feels real to me, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that means. I don't like artificial construct, you know, I don't want to feel manipulated, you know, that I feel the writer's viewpoint, you know, telling me what to think. Um, coming from a universe, you know, like the criminal courts, which is very raw, you know, and very real, you know, and you see, you know, just the exigencies of, of human nature, you know, I don't want everything sanitized because that doesn't expand anyone's awareness and that doesn't feel truthful. And, you know, my own personal theory on why people are so drawn to reality programming is, you know, they want to see something that feels real to them, even mm -hmm. if it is evidencing some of the worst values of man, you know, rather than canned programming or things that feel fake or that are following too much of a, a safe template. They want to feel something that connects to them in a real way. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to choose shows and, you know, have been lucky enough, you know, to be given the opportunity to write shows that I feel are containers to be able to address that truth and to tell stories that might get at deeper threads of truth. All the shows you've worked on, that I'm aware of anyway, are um, highly dramatic. Not a lot of humor, aside from the, the dialogue, the patter between the characters. Well, there's gallows humor. Yeah. Gallows humor. Yeah. And it's often perfectly suited to that show. Have you ever been tempted to write anything, not sitcomish, but on uh, uh, a level of comedy different from the drama that you're writing, where you have uh, characters um, who are locked into a comical situation without being sitcom? Oriented. Has that ever appealed to you? Well, I like my comedy with my drama with because drama. <laughs> I feel it heightens the comedy, you know, but a Levin, lot of yeah. what, you know, yeah. and I was able to do some of that on some of my storylines, you know, on the practice, yes. that, you know, that 
from the situ this bleak situation, sometimes the funniest and strangest predicaments arise, you know, just out of the quirkiness of that. Mm -hmm. So I like it to be grounded in because if it's just funny and isn't grounded into something truthful, then mm -hmm. it's just a momentary, you know, passing laugh, you know. And at the same time, if you're just writing something that's heavy, heavy, heavy all the time, at a certain point people block it out. It's like the spoonful of sugar. You need to relax in the moment and have, you know, that moment right. of comic relief and then you can go back into it, you know. We've discussed the possibility that uh, a pilot you're working on may appear on the networks. I'm not going to go into details because that would be carrying it too far. But can you describe the process of doing a pilot or preparing a pilot script? Because everything you've worked on, I believe, up to now has been set in characters already developed by the mm -hmm. time you arrived. So the pilot is something fresh, completely out of your imagination. The setting, the characters, the motivation of the characters. I'm, I'm sure you're thinking in terms of several episodes of plot lines. Could you describe that process for me? Yeah, it's a completely different process, yeah. which at first is daunting because you think, oh my God, I don't have the safety of these characters who are like old friends who I already right. know. Yet at the same time, once you really begin to open that up, there's complete freedom because it's, you know, for you to create that. And you do have to think, you know, what is, who, you know, it has to be a, um, a fully dimensional human being, you know, what, what is really going on with this person and understanding that people who read that script or see it for the first time don't know a thing about them, you know, so you really have to define a lot of who they are very quickly. You can't rely on the fact that the audience has this long history with that character mm -hmm. and you have to think, you know, what kind of stories can they be a voice for, you know, what's going on with them. I mean, in my case, it, it was, you know, it's almost a little like cheating, I feel, because I was around so many colorful, you know, dimensional people um, in the criminal courts that it's just very easy to remember, you know, specific quirks of them, you know, that, that I haven't seen, you know, characters I haven't seen portrayed on television and sort of bring them in and people say, oh, these are wonderful characters. I'm like, well, it's really someone I know, but, you know, <laughs> so it's, you're, you're painting the entire universe and you paint it not only with an eye for this one script, but you know, to be able to be the container for stories, you know, down the line for a long period of time. So you really have to think, you know, not only am I creating this story, which must be compelling, but I'm creating a structure for stories. And I have to think through a lot of other stories that I would be able to tell in the same way that would still remain interesting. Mm -hmm. And the audience watching that pilot for the first time on their television sets will have to identify with most, if not all, of the characters to make them want to come back the following week. There should be some personality unique to each of the characters. To make I it. mean, absolutely. I mean, they have to know those people and feel, you know, feel who they are so they're mm -hmm. not two-dimensional, you know. And at the same time, you know, it's instead of just thinking, you know, what is it that the marketplace would be wanting, you know, you have to go back again and think, what is it that I'm really wanting to say? If this is my shot to me and my voice, you know, mm -hmm. and to bring through some of my truth, how do I create a universe in which I can do that? Do you think of yourself as a plot-driven writer primarily or character-driven, or does it make any difference based upon the, the uh, experience you're trying to convey? I think at a certain, it really depends, but I think at a certain point it all becomes one. It mm -hmm. kind of flows together. I know, you know, when I was writing for the practice, you know, I was thinking of what the story is, but it was very defined by the characters within the context of that story. With Law and Order, that was, you know, doing some heavy lifting on the plot because it's very plot driven, you know, mm -hmm. so there are different pieces to the equation and you take, you know, those skills and abilities as you, you know, apprentice down the line and they all become part of your toolbox, you know, and I can't separate it out to say one or the other. Sometimes it's one way, sometimes it's the other, but more often than not, it's all integrated. It all begins to flow at once. You know, there's the big and the small of it. The big being what is the overriding idea? You know, there are a lot of stories you could write, but why? You know, why do I want to take, you know, my time here in this life, mm -hmm. you know, and my energy, you know, and devote it to going into this subject matter area, you know, and so it has to hold in that way and it also has to hold in what I would call the small, which is the scene work, the dialogue, the, the moments, because I really feel like television for me is about that moment, you know, just that moment of dialogue, that moment of connection. It comes down to the small moments of truth which really entertain and connect people, even though there's the overriding story that is leading you through those moments. With the exception of a few scenes in NYPD Blue from week to week, most of the shows that you worked on, I believe, 
tended to be focused on the workplace predominantly. That was where the primary plot worked, which makes sense because you can get distracted. One of the few times I didn't really enjoy Law and Order was when they got into the personal lives of the characters. And I don't know, I, I think I sensed that when I was watching the program, but it was primarily because I was watching the show because of the police work and the legal side of it. And although I was sympathetic to the characters and their home lives, I wasn't interested in them. And that's difficult to understand, I think, for some people to, um, to have that, that dichotomy of attitudes. But in those particular shows, it was the workplace that predominantly drew the audience to the, to the program. Well, people come to expect yeah. a particular show you know, to yeah. exist in its own universe. You know? And if that is what that, you know, the expectation that show has brought, then people are wanting to experience that. And anytime mm -hmm. you deviate or shift from it, people think, you know, well, this isn't, you know, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. You know? So it's, it's a matter of what you set your parameters up to be, you know? Because you've been so successful and you've had such an interesting and varied career, what, what, how, 10, 12 years uh, as a writer? How, how far from that? Seven years. Seven years, not quite 10. Do you now have young aspiring writers come to you for advice or do you offer advice to them wherever you may be? If, if, if you're at a college, for example, um, do you have someone walk up to you and say, can you tell me what my best next step might be. I think I'm interested in becoming a writer. What, how would you respond to something like that? Well, I think if they were expecting a how-to, they would be very disappointed yes. because you can't really tell anyone else how to do it. They have to learn that process and experience it for themselves. Mm -hmm. you know? But what you can do is share what your path has been because there are certain principles at play that are universal. Mm -hmm. They're at play for them too. You know? And I mm -hmm. wish that you know, someone had told me you know, their path long before I had to learn it for myself because I feel like, especially raised in a linear society of achievement, you know, you're sort of waiting for the next opportunity to appear and then you can comfortably step into it. And who wouldn't? It would be easy. Like had I been trying cases and someone said, we're offering you this great job as a television writer, why wouldn't I have taken it? Sure, you know? sure. But where would the challenge you know, or the learning curve have been in that? You know, it's a process of learning to have faith and learning that we don't control everything, that there are many things at play you know, going on around us all the time and learning to flow within that and learning that there are certain principles of taking a step forward and then you know, everything shifts. You know, it's not what it once was before you took that step and things can come in you know, left and right that you never could have conceived of in the first place that can help you. It's, it's learning to walk within that path that is, I think, the real learning curve. And someone can only do that for themselves. But sometimes when somebody tells you their story, you can connect to a moment of truth in that, you know, to something that reflects back to your own experience. You say, oh, yeah, I remember when I was thinking this, and I walked down that street and met this person I wasn't expecting to see, and they connected me to this person. Mm -hmm. I think if you scratch the surface of every person's path and every person's story, you begin to see things that are universal. It's just that people haven't been taught to look in that, at it with those eyes, to look at it in that way. We're taught with the intellect uh, and not so much with the intuition. And it is when you begin to blend all of those things and begin you know, experiencing your life as a multidimensional human being that things really begin happening and quick, quickening and moving. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think, you know, if anything, the benefit has been not that you know, I was able to have these great jobs, you know, and I'm certainly grateful for all of that, but that my awareness you know, was able to be raised and I was able to, to learn something, a tool of how things, I feel, work in the universe. Because there's always the next step, the next leap of faith. You know, just getting the first job, I mean, that doesn't end it all for you. There's always the next challenge about what do I write and what is the next opportunity. You know, it's an ongoing process. You know, so it's not about, you know, you know, the old metaphor, you know, giving someone a fish. It really is teaching you how to fish because, you know, until the last moment you're alive, there's all, you know, that's always at play. And until people, I think, begin to learn how things are working and begin to relax this idea of, you know, of scarcity, like, oh my God, I can't give this up because then this other thing won't happen, you know, until people begin to learn to take risks, smart risks though, like had I aspired to be, you know, a brain surgeon, it probably wouldn't have worked out because I don't have the gifts for that. But to really tune into who you are and what you feel drawn to do and what you feel you have the talent for, you know, the, the world is a place of struggle. And it's when you begin pursuing that, that be, you begin seeing all the help that is available for you, you know. And these principles are at play whether you're aware of them or not. So by becoming aware of them, you have half a chance, you know, at 
at creating the kind of life that you really desire in your heart. When I was teaching, I had students ask me how they would finally know when they were good writers, which is, it sounds like a, a very strange question, but I, I usually went back to a sports metaphor or some sort of explanation. Well, how do you know when you're playing golf or tennis that you are good enough not to embarrass yourself? They said, well, you just know. And so my, my response to them was, well, that's precisely how you know when you're a good writer. It becomes a part of your being. You don't have to ask anyone else, is this good? You know that right. it's good. I really yeah. think you know, that boldness you know, has magic to it. It's when you mm -hmm. begin to really step into what it is you, know, you believe in and what it is you want to do, mm -hmm. that other people begin to recognize you, you know, in that same way. I mean, you really create your reality that way. You know, and writing isn't like tennis where two people write against each other and there's one winner, you know, right. um, although in television it may feel that way sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, it's not a quantifiable sport. There are many voices and many truths and room for, you know, a lot of different, you know, voices and truths to come through. And so, you know, it should be, if you feel you have something to say, if you feel that this is your gift, you know, then pursue that and don't let anyone else tell you otherwise because you know just like the, my postcard said when I was a little girl sure. I knew in my heart this is what I came to do you know and I had to wind my way around to finding that out were you ever in a position on any of the episode on any of the shows you worked on where you were asked to collaborate with someone else or were you for the most part given full reign complete reign on the scripts from your idea through the shooting or or was it a combination of most of the scripts I've done have been uh, solo. However, I have done, you know, there are scripts I've done that have been in cl a collaboration. Mm -hmm. It really just depends on, you know, the time frame and the needs, you know, that that particular show has. Um, you know, but the writing process itself, even if you're collaborating and, you know, they write, you know, the first half of the script and you're writing the second half, the writing process, even though you're clear on where the story is going, mm -hmm. when you sit down, you know, and open up that channel, you know, the writing process for me is solo, you know, even though... I can combine, you know, to write a script with someone else. They're writing their part, and I'm writing mine. Because both of you are essentially going to end up at the at the end. Well, you have you, to. at some point. You're, you're you're aware of where that end will be, so you're working within that. That's right. Framework. You've got an outline, and you know, you know. It, actually, I like writing solo more because then you have flexibility. Because if you're writing the entire script, you can shift things at the beginning, knowing that then you have to address it at the end. Right. If you're, you know, like with the Law and Order script, once I wrote the back half of the script. Um, and someone else wrote the front half, I knew I had to hold to what we had agreed upon because he was you know, going to get it to that place mm -hmm. where my half kicked in and I didn't have the flexibility. You know? But uh, that was fine too and that worked out well too. It's just a different way of working. Did you ever think of, in terms, when you're doing your script, in terms of the three-act drama or was that something that never entered your mind where you had to have an introductory act and then the character development and then the conclusion or because of the, the various episodic pieces that you did, you were constrained more by what was going to be the next commercial break. So you had to have some dialogue that led to that point so that when it faded out, it would set the audience up for the next piece following the commercial. Well, there's a very particular structure to mm -hmm. our ep episodic form, and it's a four-act structure. Right. And so I just learned that, and you know, that's when I'm breaking a story that's for our episodic, that's ha how I think of it. And it is broken you know, into four basically 15-page increments. And within each act, certain things have to happen. And you, know, you end on you know, an, act, some, an act out, you know, which would theoretically make the viewers want to tune in right. after the commercial break. You know, so right. you're very aware of the structure that you're writing for. Right. So it's not a, uh, it's after the first one or two, it becomes not formula. That sounds like it's a derogatory remark. But it becomes standard for you, understood what you need to do in the next 12 to 15 pages will lead you to You're the next segment. You're very aware of what the structure is and what has to happen within mm -hmm. that act, you know, to advance it to the next place. Do you still keep in touch with friends of yours back in the public defender's office for ideas or just p you pitch ideas and say, what do you think of this? Would this play or does that ever? Come? Well, I do. I think, you know, once you've been in the trenches that way with people, they're, <laughs> they're your comrades for life. Um, sure. Not necessarily just with writing, but, you know, what some of my good friends are very valuable for are, you know,
keepers of the memories. They remember, hey, do you remember when you did that trial and that thing happened, you know, or just to call me and, you know, and tell me about the things that they're experiencing that reminds me of what I went through, you know, when there's a tremendous victory, you know, mm -hmm. or a tremendous loss, you know, it just keeps me very connected into, you know, the emotional place I was at when I was doing that work, you know, and uh, there are a lot of good stories, you know, that's, they're my entertainment, you know, they're sure. my source of entertainment. That's right. Yeah. Have you considered doing feature films? At this point in your career? I would love to do that, you know, and that maybe is one of the next transitions. You yeah. know, meeting David Milch in the chocolate shop, it made it very clear to me that what the universe had handed me was this, you know, incredible opportunity in television, you know, and then that was my path in, and we'll see where it goes from here, you know. And in fact, if I, I believe you mentioned that you'd met Gregory Hoblet, the director, who was then only doing television, or he had just begun doing features when you first met him. He was doing the... Uh, the primal, was it primal fear? It was primal fear, yeah. And, and I, of course, knew nothing about him or anything. But to do he had begun with prior. Bochco on Hill Street Blues, so he had made that leap. So it's interesting that you'd That's right, you, you put all the elements in place. Yeah. You begin to see a pattern to it, you know, <laughs> in the universe that you know you couldn't even see in the moment because That's all right. I knew was he was directing this film in this moment, you know, in this parking lot of the jail, you know. Amazing. Thank you very much, Jill, for being with me today. This has been spectacular. I've enjoyed myself so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being with us on this edition of In the Credits. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.